God bless the great state of Wisconsin. What an incredible victory tonight. And thank you to your tremendous governor, Governor Scott Walker, for his principled, passionate leadership. Tonight is a turning point. It is a rallying cry. It is a call from the hardworking men and women of Wisconsin to the people of America. We have a choice, a real choice. The national political terrain began to change two weeks ago. In the state of Utah, we won 69% of the vote, a landslide election. <laughs> winning every single delegate in the state. Then, just three days ago in Colorado, two congressional districts voted. Once again, they elected six delegates, and of those six delegates, we won all six. And then two days ago in North Dakota, we had another tremendous win. They elected their delegates. Of the delegates who have specified their support, 18 are supporting our campaign. One is supporting Donald Trump. Eighteen to one, I'll take that ratio any day of the week. And now tonight, here in Wisconsin, a state that just three weeks ago the media had written off of. Three weeks ago, the media said Wisconsin was a perfect state for Donald Trump. But the hardworking men and women of Wisconsin stood and campaigned tirelessly to make sure that tonight was a victory for every American. different states, Utah, Colorado, North Dakota, Wisconsin, four victories. So just how significant is tonight? Well, just today, our campaign has raised over $2 million. People all over the country going to tedcruz.org, tedcruz.org, tedcruz.org. <laughs> Contributing $10 or $25 or $50, we've had over 1.3 million contributions. In the last two weeks, and in the coming days when Colorado and Wyoming finish voting, we are likely to have gained over 100 delegates on Donald Trump. Yeah. And as a result of tonight, as a result of the people of Wisconsin defying the media, defying the pundits, I am more and more convinced that our campaign is going to earn the 1,237 delegates needed to win the Republican nomination. Either before Cleveland or at the convention in Cleveland, together we will win a majority of the delegates and together we will beat Hillary Clinton in November. Tonight was a bad night for Hillary Clinton. 
It was a bad night in the Democratic primary, and it was an even worse night for her in the Republican primary. We are winning because we're uniting the Republican Party. Of the 17 candidates who started this race, a terrific, talented, dynamic field, five have now endorsed this campaign. Rick Perry and Lindsey Graham and Jeb Bush and Carly Fiorina. And Wisconsin's own Governor Scott Walker. When you toss in Senator Mike Lee and Mark Levin, We've got the full spectrum of the Republican Party coming together and uniting behind this campaign. In 1960, accepting the Democratic Party's nomination, John F. Kennedy observed, I think the American people expect more from us than cries of indignation and attack. The times are too grave, the challenge too urgent, and the stakes too high to permit the customary passions of political debate. We are not here to curse the darkness, but to light the candle that can guide us to see through that darkness to a safe and sane future. As Winston Churchill said on taking office, if we open a quarrel, between the present and the past, we shall be in danger of losing the future. The same is true today. Tonight, Wisconsin has lit a candle guiding the way forward. Tonight, we once again have hope for the future. Tonight is about unity, and tonight is about hope. Young people in America once again have hope that we will bring jobs back to America. <laughs> By repealing Obamacare, passing it. Reining in the federal regulators that are killing small businesses. Passing a flat tax. And abolishing the IRS. We will unleash incredible economic growth. Our border will finally be made secure, and sanctuary cities will end. Yeah. Truck drivers and mechanics and plumbers and steel workers, union members, men and women with calluses on their hands, will once again see wages rising, opportunity expanding. Working moms, working moms struggling to make ends meet will see take-home pay rising, the cost of living falling, and Common Core ending. Catholic schools and Jewish day schools, Brigham Young and the Little Sisters of the Poor will see a Supreme Court that protects their religious liberty.
the fundamental freedom of every one of us. How, I'm going to lower that sound. I'm so sorry. Um, I am going to take you now to Miami, Florida, where there is a death at a carnival. Apparently, it was one of the carnival employees. I don't have much information on this, but uh, I wanted to take you to these visuals we're getting out of Miami, the death of a carnival worker. doing snapchat fantastic what hashtag hashtag democracy spring uh that's what we're a part of it's uh we're wanting to get money out of politics take our democracy back uh, and restore uh, the voting rights act yeah restore voting rights uh, for elections for everyone so what should they who what are, what are we looking up? What are we looking up to find you guys, to support you guys? Democracy. 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 All right. Uh, yeah. You're about to be on YouTube right yeah. now on my channel. And we're, uh, we're going to be marching in there on April 11th. And for at least six days, we'll be sitting in at the Capitol. Mass so, civil disobedience. Mass civil disobedience. Awesome. Awesome. And we're going to get arrested. Right. We want Congress to act. Okay. Okay. And right now we're on Marty in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, they're marching to Washington right now. Day three. You guys, voting in this election? Yes. Who Who are we vote, voting for? We don't. We don't endorse candidates. Fantastic. That's just as good. That's just as good. I don't need you to. I'm voting for Bernie. A lot of us, but we're I would, I would imagine so, but that's not what this is about. But I'm voting for Bernie. Yeah. May when? That would be awesome. It's, 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 a week in, it's a week in May. It's called the Rubber Stamp Rebellion. Hold on, I'm about to tell you. Wait, say that again. It's in May. It's called the Rubber Stamp Rebellion. May when? For how long? Uh, for a week. It's um, it's an escalation in a campaign against hydraulic fracking. Um, wow. Which, um, is put on by an organization which is a bunch of frontline communities organizing together to uh, um, demonstrate in DC. They've done some really cool stuff. The last week, the last time we gathered was an 18-day hunger strike Thank in you. DC in September, um, leading up to the Pope's visit, Pope uh -huh. Francis. And I don't know what's in store for. Um, but if you go to beyondextremeenergy.org, all one word, uh -huh. um, you'll probably be able to find more details as it comes closer to the date. Okay. The people and by the people. That sounds familiar. Sounds like my man. <laughs> Thank you. For your every little bit helps. Every exposure on social media. Thank you. Rebecca. Very happy that I met a Hillary fan who was yeah. hardcore about her candidate, and I respect her. She respects me. So that's. Sounds like some of the local residents are shouting out their support, hopefully not opposition. Okay.
called Democracy Spring because put, because big um, moneyed interest corporations are basically buying elections by funding campaigns. Um, and people's votes really don't matter as much at this point. Huh. So we're trying to fight to get democracy back. Here's a flyer. Trust me, I got a whole bunch of flyers. Thank you. Thank you, that's awesome. Oh, and after the march, there is um, sit-ins for uh, thousands of people are going to risk arrest to, uh, for this issue. No doubt. Anybody voting for Bernie? Yes. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> Uh -huh. Who are you voting for? Are you voting for? We're a nonpartisan organization. I know you guys are. But uh, we actually, my organization, the Hampshire Rebellion, is about a third conservative and about two thirds liberal. Okay. So we really do. We're You're a okay. real nonpartisan group because okay. we're going to fix campaign finance reform on both sides. Right You're right. You're absolutely right. So we're, we're working very hard. New Hampshire Rebellion is one of a hundred groups that's involved in this. New Hampshire Rebellion. So we're going on December. On uh, April 11th, we're going to sit in, in uh, on Capitol Hill. Okay. And uh, we have 2,000 people already signed up for this. Awesome. So I mean, not awesome, but but awesome. But it's, it's unfortunate we have to take these steps. You know what? But it's fantastic that you guys are willing to do it. All right? I'm, I'm praying for a change, too. I'm a Bernie supporter, but you, you don't have to be. Right. I'll, I'll make the call for you. For my dogs. Uh, I'm going to wash this cool I mean, I can't believe this is happening, man. I'm waiting for Ashton Kutcher to go, you pumped! Uh, I get to introduce the first lady. Um, wow, uh, okay, here we go, guys, here we go. Um, first of all, I wanna say that I'm grateful to the Obamas for uh, celebrating uh, Nowruz for the second year in a row here at the White House. And they're recognizing that this tradition is part of the American fabric, okay? And um, let me tell you uh, about the First Lady. The First Lady, I swear, every time I see her, she is an inspiration to everybody I know, as well as myself. Um, whenever I see her on any program, I'm not kidding, every time I watch her, I just find myself nodding and going, yeah, she's right, she's right! <laughs> she's an amazing lady, um, her warm smile, her, 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 her gracious uh, um, spirit, and her positive uh, message is the best way to bring us all into a new spring and into Nowruz. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama! Mubarak. Yes! Are you guys having a good time? Yes! I hope so. I can hear you upstairs. You do know that. Well, it is really, truly a pleasure to welcome you to the White House today, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate our second White House Nowruz than being with all of you this afternoon. And let me start by thanking Maz. I mean, we were cracking up backstage. Maz, thank you so much, Maz. I got a chance to meet Maz backstage with his beautiful family, and he is hilarious. Um, so I'm just grateful for that wonderful introduction and happy that he could be here. I also want to thank uh, the many members of the White House staff who've worked so hard uh, to make this event possible. And Pani is not on the list. I'm going to start with Pani. <laughs> and Ferial. I didn't even see Ferial. Ferial, where are you? Where are you? Where is she? My husband is making her work. 
you can blame him. But I want to thank those two. They are two of my favorite people. Pani, I know she's so embarrassed. Oh, Fairy, I love you, sweetie. You guys did a great job. I'm so proud of you two. I love you both. Way to go. Uh, and I want to make sure we to recognize our extraordinary new White House florist. <laughs> Hadia Zafari and Hadia, I saw you. You were running around without your clothes on. Not, not, dressed, not dressed for the event with her sister. She has been phenomenal. We have gotten so many compliments on the floral arrangements here at the White House. And she has a wonderful spirit. And we're just so happy to have her on our staff. Hydea, if you're out there, thank you, thank you. But most of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. This is an amazing group. You guys have a lot of energy because it's the new year and we're all very excited. Uh, we've got a pretty eclectic group here. I understand we've got the star, one of the stars from Blackish, who's here we hung out with at the Easter egg roll. She told me she and her family were going to be here. We've got folks from companies like Google and Facebook. You can shout out for your people. We've got the co-founder of Periscope, the video app, who is here. We've got renowned artists. We have accomplished scholars and physicians. We've got some fabulous students and musicians. And many, many others. So we're happy to have you all here. I hope that after spending the recent weeks celebrating Nauru's with your loved ones and enjoying the outdoors, that you're excited as, as excited as we are to host you here. And as we always say, uh, this is your house. This is the people's house. And yes! So enjoy, as Barack says, just don't break anything. <laughs> That's why when Barack and I first got here, we committed to opening this place up to as many people from as many different backgrounds as possible, especially folks who have never been through these doors before. And that, that's particularly true for so many of the young people we bring into this house who would have never thought they'd walk into the White House and have a place to call their own. Um, we think America is strongest when we recognize our many traditions when we celebrate our diversity, uh, and when we lift each other up. And in times like these, when uh, we think of all that's, that's most important than ever before, right now and today with what's going on. Right now when we're hearing so much disturbing and hateful rhetoric, it is so important to remember that our diversity has been and will always be our greatest source of strength and pride here in the United States. We, yeah. we are a nation of immigrants, and we should cherish the talent and energy and the beautiful traditions and cultures that come with that heritage, not just today, but every day. But we're happy to be celebrating it right here with you all today. So I'm proud that here at the White House, we host special events to mark the holidays. I think Maz went through a few of them. But we celebrate St. Patrick's Day, Diwali, Cinco de Mayo. Um, and with your help today, we're celebrating Nowruz, which is one of our newest White House traditions. And as we celebrate this holiday and honor this tradition that is over 3,000 years old, we join families in the Middle East and in Asia, here in America, across the globe to mark both the dawning of a new year and the arrival of spring. And hopefully we feel a little springy today, even though the weather, the temperature doesn't indicate that. In so many communities worldwide, Nauru's is a time to visit loved ones. Uh, it's a time to reflect on the past year uh, and to renew our hopes for the new year to come. And we have a lot to reflect upon since last year's Noruz. And as we consider the flowers and the trees that are finally in bloom, isn't it beautiful outside? Ah, yeah. oh, it's so good. And the dreams and aspirations that we all share as Americans and as human beings, I think we can have even higher hopes for peace and prosperity in the years to come. As the great Persian poet Hafez once wrote, and these are his words, out of a great need, 
we are all holding hands and climbing. And as we come together and set our sights on the future, we have once again created this beautiful White House half scene uh, that's behind me. I'd like to say I had something to do with it, but I know Hydea did everything. <laughs> Just like the ones you create in your home, it is filled to the brim with our seven S's of wishes for the year ahead, from grass sprouts representing the blooming of nature, to apples uh, for health and beauty, which I believe in deeply, and many other symbols of love and joy. And because no Nauru celebration would be complete without plenty of food to share with family and friends, I hope that you all have enjoyed all the traditional dishes I haven't had a chance to taste yet, some of which uh, feature the ingredients from our very home, own White House kitchen garden. Yes. So I want us to take a moment to thank our fabulous guest chef, uh, Najmia Batmanglish. I got to meet Najmia and her family back, back in the back, and she told me to make sure I try the soup because it brings good luck, so I'm going to do that. What? Oh, all right, I'm going to try some. And Najmia worked, of course, with our amazing White House chefs. Let's give them all a round of applause. I hope the food has been good. And finally, for our entertainment today, we have the Nomad Dancers. And all the way from Vienna, we have the Center for Persian Classical Music, uh, directed by Nader Majd, who is here. They're going to be performing for us shortly. And I know they will be amazing. So let me just end by thanking you all. Thank you for your love and your friendship and your support and your kind words and your prayers and your hard work uh, and the pride with which you live and raise your children uh, because in the end, it's all about our kids, right? We are creating a country and a world. Yes, that's the proud mother. I see your daughter right there. Um, Thank you. This is. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. We are honored to have you here at the White House. So I want you to make yourselves at home. I want you to enjoy every second of it. And just remember, we are always with you. We are thinking and working for you every single day. We love you too. Happy Nauru's. Enjoy. All right, what we're looking at is out of Miami, Florida, where there's been an accident at a carnival there. Uh, one deceased, uh, the, it's called the hurricane, the ride. The individual um, ride was not in use at the time of the accident, and that is what we are hovering on here in Miami, Florida. a bit. Trump now needs to win 58% of the remaining delegates at stake to hit the magic number of 1237 before the convention. It's virtually impossible for Cruz to get there now. He needs 87% and of course Kasich actually is mathematically eliminated, but he has been for a while now. He's up to 132% which is why his only shot is a contested convention. The next big prize is New York, where Trump holds a sizable lead, according to many recent polls. In fact, you are now looking at live pictures of the scene outside a venue where Trump is holding a rally tonight in Beth Page, Long Island. Beth Page, known for hosting the U.S. Open about a decade ago. Police are bracing for large crowds and perhaps thousands of anti-Trump protesters. 
We'll keep a close eye on that situation in this hour. But as we said, folks, yesterday we told you that the margin in Wisconsin was critical. Cruz picked up a net gain of 30 delegates on Trump. And here's why that number looms large. Our political unit has crunched the numbers here. And we've looked at all of the remaining contests on the board. And based on our back of the envelope math, Trump could very well end up missing that magic number of 1237 by, you guessed it, somewhere in the vicinity of 30 to 60 delegates. How about that? Basically the number that Cruz got. We should note this is all based on hypothetical. We'll look at the rest of the race. And as we've seen before, anything can happen. With that said, let's dive in. And by the way, we do assume that Trump basically recovers a bit from Wisconsin and is at least as strong as he's been so far. So we'll begin with last night's results. As I mentioned, Trump picked up just six of, the, of Wisconsin's 42 bound delegates. It gives him a total of 756 delegates. He now needs 481 to hit 1237. The next delegate action is Saturday when the state of Colorado will choose its delegates at the state's convention. Some of these folks running to become delegates will tip their hand and commit to supporting a candidate. We expect for now roughly five of them total to be Trump delegates. We're giving him that assumption. Maybe less than that. He could get goose egg, but we'll we'll give him five for now. Moving ahead to April 16th, it's Wyoming. They'll also be choosing a, sl a slate of delegates at their state convention. 26 are bound. And we don't expect Trump to get any of them there. That's where Cruz seems to be out organizing them. Then it's on to New York on the 19th. If Trump can hit 50 percent, he gets all the states at large delegates, but that is a very high bar. At this point, we don't think he'll get out uh, all of it, although he'll still likely pick up a lion's share of what's available in New York. So we're going to give him 75 in this estimate. A new Monmouth University poll of likely Republican voters in New York today had Trump barely above the 50 percent threshold. There is really no room for error for him on that one. Which then brings us to April 26, when Connecticut, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island all hold their contests. Delaware and Pennsylvania are winner take all. Now we expect Trump to win those states, but we should note in Pennsylvania only 17 of the state's 71 delegates are bound to vote for the statewide winner. So we're also expecting Trump to do well in the other states that night. So if you add them all up, and you can see our estimates there, we could have Trump getting somewhere around 931 delegates total by the April 27th, the end of those April 26th primaries. That brings us to May 3rd. It's Indiana. The Trump campaign has acknowledged that they got a late start in the Hoosier state. We think Trump could end up at best with a dozen delegates there. It's possible because they do it sort of similar to Wisconsin. He could get totally shut out. But for this estimate, we're giving him 12. On May 10th, it's Nebraska and West Virginia. They both hold primaries. Nebraska is winner take all. But since Cruz is one, in neighboring states like Iowa and Kansas. We don't expect Trump to win this one, so we're giving him a goose egg there. But we are calculating Trump could have roughly 973 delegates by that point because we do expect him to do well in West Virginia. Next up is Oregon. Delegates there are awarded proportionally. Let's say Trump, we'll give him half of them. I actually think we're overestimating there. I think he's going to do worse. But again, best case scenario, essentially, we'll give him half. So we're now at the end of May, folks. Washington state is not exactly Trump country, but he'll pick up a few delegates. So we'll give him some there. Again, we may be overestimating, but we're going to give him some there. Best case scenario that could put him over the 1000 mark before the June primaries. So, folks, we have now hit the final day of the primary season. June 7th, it's a big one. California, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, and South Dakota. In California, most of the state's delegates are awarded by congressional district. We assume Trump will pick up a sizable haul there, but there is some dispute about how well he'll do. Again, we are being generous with Trump for now and giving him 120. Montana's winner take all. Frankly, we'd be surprised if Trump were able to win there. I think that feels like a cruise state. New Jersey is winner take all. That should be a good state for Trump. And we expect Trump to clean up in the Garden State, thanks in part to Chris Christie's endorsement. Then they have South Dakota, also winner take all. But as you know, the Plains, the Midwest hasn't been Trump country. Put that one in for Cruz. That adds up now to a total of roughly 1,194 delegates. That is 43 shy of 1237. Again, we were very generous in these estimates. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a pool of unbound delegates up for grabs from various states and territories. The exact number is in flux, but it could total somewhere around 120 to as many as 300 if those Rubio delegates become unbound. But if our math shakes out, Trump is going to need a big chunk of those unbound delegates to win the nomination on the first ballot. So there you have it, folks. It is a very rough path forward for Trump. It is a very shall we say, uh, a positive, optimistic path for Trump. And even in the most optimistic scenario, he comes up short. Let's talk about where things stand. Brad Todd, the Republican.
strategist and ad maker. He was advising a super PAC supporting Bobby Jindal's 2016 bid. And Carrie Dan is in our uh, NBC News political unit, political editor there. She's been helping us crunch these numbers all year long, not just all day long. Carrie, how are you? So, Carrie, let's let's go very quickly. Um, again, walk people through. We assumed that Trump would be at least as strong as he has been, correct? Exactly. This is a pretty rosy estimate for Donald Trump. It assumes that he comes in, as you said, with sort of the strength that he showed before that Wisconsin contest. For example, we're estimating that he'll come away from New York with 75 of the 95 delegates that are up for grabs. We're assuming he'll get 20 in Connecticut. So places where there's favorable ground for him, we are giving him a, a pretty rosy estimate, as well as some of those states like Washington and Oregon. Those are proportional states. He could come up short of where the estimate is that we have put him at. Right now, we've shown, with this rosy estimate, him coming up about that 40 delegate short that you mentioned. Now, obviously, it's going to be about the margins. As much right. fun as it is to picture a photo finish at the very end, right. he's seven delegates behind. Right. He's going to be, be, be able to pick up those well, unbound folks. And, Brad, that's what I'm curious about at the convention. So Trump comes in, let's say our rosy scenario plays out, and he's less than 50 short. Rosy. That's fine, but he's less than 50 short. He probably can find 50 on bounds. I think he'll negotiate all, all of June. And yeah. yes, it's, he's actually coming to a pretty big fork in the road. And I think the worst thing possible is going to happen to Donald Trump. He's going to win New York. He doesn't need to win New York for his men, mental state, mm -hmm. but it's going to restore his confidence. And truth is, Trump needs to make some adjustments, and a win won't make him do that. But he's, he's coming up on a window where he has to, to get in a posture to negotiate in June. And that's a much more welcoming posture you than mean, he Attacking like. the party in a statement Correct. last night was not the. I mean, that's the part of, uh, that I didn't understand where they, it wasn't well thought through. Yes, the party's stealing it from you. This very party that you have to negotiate with. The same exact people he has to woo in June. I mean, if, if he's going to come in short uh, of 1237, it's all about how he can, what his powers of persuasion are, not his powers of attack. All right, let's go. You're, you're, you look at our scenario here, and Jeff Rowe is running the Ted Cruz campaign. He's got to figure out how to de rosify these I, scenarios <laughs> in, in various places. What, what states where Trump is likely to do well could he, un, could the Cruz campaign um, overperform? Uh, is it, is it, is it New York and California? Where is it? Well, in the individual congressional districts in both New York and California, picking those off is going to uh, hit into Donald Trump's margins, trying to keep him under 50 percent in New York with the combined efforts of Ted Cruz and John Kasich. That would be obvious uh, place of performance. you got to play defense, too. Donald Trump is seeding a bunch of winner-take-all states, places like Montana, Nebraska, South Dakota. We're assuming he's not going to do well. That's not favorable ground for him. Then Indiana is going to be uh, also kind of a big black box. That's a state that we haven't seen a lot of polling in thus far. It's a place that you want to make sure that Donald Trump isn't making up any ground. We estimated for him 12 delegates out of there. But as you said, that could be a goose egg. It's a state that looks a lot like Wisconsin mm -hmm. in the way they allocate their delegates. Keeping Donald Trump to a zero there really cuts in his margins as well. So where, where, how do you think Cruz goes about this? Because to me, the trickiest situations are New York, California, New Jersey. I think there are three states Cruz needs to focus on. Indiana is obviously first. A big, all three candidates can make a case for why they can win Indiana. Cruz really, really needs to win it. Uh, Maryland is another place. You you know, Donald Trump fared very poorly in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. on the Virginia side. He fared very poorly in D.C. itself. Maryland's primary looks a lot like Northern Virginia's and D.C.'s. And so Ted Cruz and John Kasich, they need to deny Trump, Trump in Maryland. Do they, but do they need to work together on this one? Well, I, that, you, that doesn't happen. Right. Okay, that just doesn't happen. But I think the, more, the, the statement about Northern Virginia really was that Trump was weak there. In every suburb where there are high income, high education voters, Trump fails. Uh, he's only succeeded in Chicago of all those places. Probably will succeed in some of the New York suburbs. Yeah, in Chicago only because of a unique situation that happened right. the weekend before with, yes. the, with, with, with what happened. The third situation place Cruz needs to focus is California. It's a very diverse state. The Congress, it's really 53 states. It's not one state. Right. And, and so, Cruz, there are a lot of opportunities. He needs to win at least a third of the congressional districts in California. In, uh, I guess the, the other thing that um, I've picked up on, and I think it fits why he didn't do well in Wisconsin, Trump seems to do best where Republicans have not done well on a state level or where it's a fractured Republican. We have Republican governors, Republican yeah. voters generally happy with their governors. That's right, Republican go right. It, So it's, it's interesting and in we don't have a lot of instances yet, but in primaries, so you've got in primaries where the state, not caucuses, in primaries so you, you, where you have Democratic governors, Trump has won those. Uh, Virginia, Vermont, uh, I, uh, Louisiana is another one. New Hampshire, of course, is another one. And the Northeast is filled with states with Democratic Well, governors. these are rookie mistakes. Uh, he's a first-time candidate and it's showing and, and the fact that he goes into Wisconsin and attacks 
Scott Walker. Uh, he doesn't show the finger with an 80 percent approval rating among Republican primary and the voters. Republican primary voters have defended him three straight times in elections. They have ownership in Scott Walker and Trump. His ego got in the way, but that's the case a lot of times. His ego is getting in the way of him having strong advisors. His ego got in the way of him not doing a 30 minute speech last night. His ego gets in the way of attacking Scott Walker. Uh, it's a stumbling block and that's why he keeps getting 35 percent. John Kasich. He's the one in second place in New York and not Ted Cruz. How does this get itself worked out? Well, and John Casey could be one of the people who can, who keeps Donald Trump from getting that 50% right. mm -hmm. in New York. So that's going to be a place too. that he, yeah, in Connecticut as well, a place that he can play as a spoiler. But again, yesterday, he performed very poorly, even in places that we thought he was going to do well, like, like Madison, Madison yeah. Dane County. We thought maybe John Casey would be able to pull out. He came in third, a close third, but third. Second straight state where it looked like he was going to do well. Utah was another one, and then he sort of collapsed at the. There's not a lot of market for a moderate in Republican primary, and Casey's right. finding that out. The hard way. All right. Brad Todd, Kerry Dan. Fun to do this. We'll be doing this back of the envelope thing, I think, all the way. It's like we're all like Russell exactly. Crowe in a beautiful mind. There you go. <laughs> uh, except I think Russell Crowe would probably do a better job of it. Uh, this is much harder sometimes, isn't it? Bernie Sanders wins big in the Badger State, but can his momentum beat back the reality of the math? Up next, more backlash over religious freedom laws. We're going to look at the fight that's spreading across the South and whether it's all heading for a big court case. Stay tuned. There are two billion people who don't have access to basic banking, but that is changing. At Temenos, with the Microsoft Cloud, we can enable a banker to travel to the most remote locations with nothing but a phone and a tablet. Everywhere where there's a phone, you have a bank. Now a person is able to start a business and employ somebody for the first time. The Microsoft Cloud helped us to bring banking to 10 million people in just two years. It's transforming our world. With Booking.com's free cancellation, you could just forget the beach wedding and the beach booty. With our victory tonight in Wisconsin, we have now won seven out of eight of the last caucuses and primaries. That was Bernie Sanders last night in Laramie, Wyoming, after his big win in Wisconsin. The senator says momentum is on his side after beating Hillary Clinton last night with 57 percent of the vote. It's still a long climb for Senator Sanders, though Clinton is leading Sanders by over 600 delegates, even after last night's contest. If you count the super delegates, delegates he needs 67 percent of the remaining delegates in order to win. But Sanders is pushing on. Wyoming holds their caucus on Saturday and then on April 19th, voters head to the polls in New York, where 247 pledged delegates are up for grabs. And on April 26th, we've got Pennsylvania, along with a whole bunch of other states holding their primary. Meanwhile, that's where both candidates are campaigning today. Clinton holding events in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, both candidates in Philadelphia later. Let's turn to NBC's Kristen Welker. She's covering the Clinton campaign. She's in Pittsburgh. Kristen, how's it going? Hey, Kate, well, the Clinton campaign stressing that point that you just brought up, that she still has a significant delegate lead in the wake of that Wisconsin win by Senator Sanders. That, of course, marks his sixth straight win in a row. So the Clinton campaign, as one aide told me, now it's on to New York. And the focus is on New York right now with its more than 200 delegates. And it's, of course, Secretary Clinton's adopted home state. So you can expect to see all hands on deck there. Today, she has been aggressively going going after him, slamming him for that interview that he gave to the New York Daily News. And a couple of points that they're stressing in particular. Some of her surrogates held a call with reporters earlier today criticizing him for saying that he doesn't think the victims of Sandy Hook should be able to sue gun manufacturers. Those are comments that could resonate in a place like New York and, of course, in Connecticut. And she's also criticizing him sharply for not really being able to explain how he is going to break up the big banks. That's, of course, one of the central Central tenants of his campaign. So it's giving us a little bit of a preview of what we can expect to see in the coming weeks. Now, if you look at the polls, Secretary Clinton still leads Senator Sanders by 12 points in New York. That's according to the latest Quinnipiac poll, but that's down from about 20 points from a few weeks ago. So it's going to be a real race there. She's also holding on to Pennsylvania, trying to at least that is where she's campaigning today in Philadelphia earlier today, and she'll be here in Pittsburgh in just a few hours. Kate? All right, Kristen Welker, last time I saw you was it Sunday? I don't, it's like you've been in 
three states <laughs> since the last time the I saw you. All the days blend together. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Kristen Welker, thanks, <laughs> thanks so Kate. much. Let's turn to MSNBC's Alex Seitzwald. He's covering the Sanders campaign from Washington, D.C. today. Alex, a lot of criticism, and we've just heard about it, from Hillary Clinton about this interview that Sanders did with the New York Daily News and the headline there. How's the Sanders campaign responding? Yeah, okay. Well, it's a multi front attack, so let's take them one at a time. Uh, number one on the banks, which Kristen mentioned, it's been a big issue for Sanders. He seemed to struggle a little bit on how exactly he would break them up. We just got a statement from Michael Briggs, the spokesperson, putting a little flesh on the bone. Let me read it to you. He says, We don't need any lessons on getting things done in Congress from someone who didn't pass a single amendment by a roll call vote during her entire career in the Senate. Within the first 100 days of his administration, Senator Sanders will require the Secretary of the Treasury Department to establish a too big to fail list of commercial banks, shadow banks, and insurance companies whose failure would pose a catastrophic risk to the United States economy without a taxpayer bailout. Within a year, the Sanders administration will work with the Federal Reserve and financial regulators to break these institutions up using the authority of Section 121 of the Dodd Frank Act. So, getting a little bit more specific there. On another front, take a look at the front page of the New York Daily News today after that interview, really hitting Sanders very hard for his comments about guns. Uh, he said that he d does not support an, an uh, issue by Sandy Hook victims to sue gun manufacturers. Uh, in response to that, Tad Devine, the top strategist to the Sanders campaign, uh, spoke with Andrea Mitchell earlier today, and he said uh, Bernie Sanders is no shill of the gun industry. Take a look. He lost his first election for Congress because he stood up and said in Vermont, a rural state that has no gun control, that he would support ban on assault weapons. He has a D-minus lifetime rating from the NRA on the issue of manufacturer liability. He recently signed on as a co-sponsor to legislation, which would deal with that issue in the current Congress. So I would say to them, they should take a look at his record. Uh, other Sanders aides have pointed out that Clinton has taken money from NRA lobbyists, so a lot of back and forth on this, Kate. All right, Alex, thanks so much. And let me bring in Dan Cannonen. He's vice president for advocacy for the Smoot Twos Group and 2008 Wisconsin State Director for the Obama campaign. Not supporting any candidate in particular this time around, right, Dan? That's right. Okay, but thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Um, let's talk about this sort of battle in the among the Democrats today and where we stand after Wisconsin as we look forward. Sanders is saying he's on a winning streak. I mean, he's pointing to all these wins, seven out of the last eight. Will momentum help him going into New York, Pennsylvania, et cetera? I'm not sure it will, Kate. If you look at Wisconsin, we expected it to be a pretty sizable victory for Sanders going into Election Day. I think he had a very good day on balance. You look at his support throughout the state. He certainly did well in Madison and Dane County, but he had strong support in the third, in the sixth, in the seventh, winning with, uh, I think, hefty margins throughout most of the state. I think a lot of that, though, has to do with the nature of the electorate. Um, it was a huge turnout in Wisconsin on Tuesday, but actually slightly less on the Democratic side as compared to 2008, when 1.1 million voters uh, voted in the Democratic primary between Clinton and Obama in that election, only about a million this time around. And that may not seem like a lot, but what it meant is that there were at least a hundred or a couple hundred thousand centrists, moderates, folks who in an open primary can pick whether they're going to vote on the Democratic side or the Republican side, who in 2008 almost all voted on the Democratic side of the ledger, making it a slightly more moderate centrist electorate, and in 2016, making it really a pretty liberal electorate, which I think is borne out by the exit polls, showing that at least two-thirds of those that voted yesterday were either somewhat or very liberal. That kind of electorate isn't going to be there for him in the next few primaries, which are closed primaries. And in particular, uh, her home state of New York is a place where I think uh, she'll have a much better chance of putting together the kind of coalition that will take to win that state and halt some momentum that Sanders may feel they have right now. Interesting. And let me ask you about a couple more of the exit poll numbers that we got last night because it, sure. it shows for Sanders what helped him win. 83% of Wisconsin Democratic primary voters said honesty was the most important quality in a candidate. They voted for Sanders. 82% of Sanders voters, um, 18 to 29 years old. 72% of independents went for Sanders. And a lot of men, 64% of men yeah. voted for Sanders. So you look at those numbers as someone who, who worked the state for Obama, and what yeah. do you what do you tell candidate Sanders to do now as he moves forward? How does he how does he bring maybe more people in the tent, or or does he does he just focus in on independence and men? Yeah, I think independence men are certainly the strength of his campaign, particularly independence. 
Uh, but I really, again, think it depends on the kind of primary he's talking about. In an open primary where you can have those kind of new voters that come into the process, same-day registration, he had a real opportunity to, to sock those folks into his camp on Tuesday, and he did. It's going to be harder in other states to do that, but I think focusing on them is the best path he has. I just wonder if you look at a huge win like he had yesterday, but only able to net 10 delegates when he's already 220 behind, I don't know how he does it in a way that appreciably changes the delegate count going forward. Uh, if he's able to, that's a different story, but if he's not in New York, then I think the math catches up to him really quickly. Dan Cannon, and nice to have you with us. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Kate. Let me bring in Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty. She's Connecticut. Uh, her district is in Connecticut, the congressional district that covers Newtown, Connecticut. We should point out she's also supporting Hillary Clinton. Congresswoman, thanks for being with us. Great to be with you, Kate. Um, we've just been talking about the New York Daily News interview that Bernie Sanders did and Hillary Clinton slamming him for his comments. Uh, here's part of what Senator Sanders actually said about the issue of Sandy Hook and families that are trying to sue the gun manufacturers there. Uh, this is a quote from Bernie Sanders. He said to the New York Daily News, if you're a gun dealer and you sell me a gun and I go out and I kill him and he gestured to someone in the room, do I think that gun mm -hmm. dealer should be sued for selling me a legal legal product that he misused, and he shook his head no. But I do believe that gun manufacturers and gun dealers should be able to be sued when they know that, they're, that guns are going into the hands of wrong people. So if somebody walks in and says, I'd like 10,000 rounds of ammunition, you know, well, you might be suspicious about that. So I think there are grounds for those suits, but not if you sell me a legal product. So he seems to be arguing that manufacturers aren't the right party to hold responsible in certain cases. And you would say what? I would say that Hillary Clinton has been there on the sign of, side of gun safety legislation for decades, and that's a large part of my support for her, particularly in a district that represents Newtown. You know, Senator, what Senator Sanders believes or doesn't believe about gun violence prevention is a little unclear. He keeps having to explain himself over and over again, but this is clear. Well, Hillary Clinton has been there every single time. And on this question of liability, we have safer cars in America today because people were allowed to sue the manufacturers of defective cars and of cars that didn't function well. That's part of how we fix things in America. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of allowing the folks I represent, the families who are decimated and, and killed in Newtown, to challenge the gun manufacturers to make safer products and be careful about how they market them. That's exactly how our society works. The Sanders' campaign says that the senator does support new legislation uh, where you work on Capitol Hill that would allow people to sue gun manufacturers under certain conditions. It's a little bit complex, but he is supporting that legislation. Is, is that enough? Would that allow the case involving those families from Sandy Hook to, to move forward? I'm not the legal expert on, on this lawsuit, but I will tell you this. We need a president who is committed and passionate and steadfast in doing something in this country about the slaughter of 33,000 Americans a year from gun violence. And, and this is one of those areas of real distinction between Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton. And Secretary Clinton has been on this issue for decades, has been right on it every single time. And, and for me and for those of us in Connecticut, I have to say this is a defining distinction. I want to know that my president is somebody who takes this issue seriously, who isn't parsing the words in lawsuits, who isn't parsing the words in statutes, but is saying we can and we must do better to keep Americans but safe. But he is, and Hillary to be, Clinton to be has fair, he's saying he does support legislation now that would allow for those kind of lawsuits. So is, there, is it really that big a, a, a gap between their two positions? To be clear, he voted in favor of extending, twice voted in favor of extending liability exemption for, for the gun lobby. Twice he voted in favor of it, and, and he has not made this a core issue. He has not been standing by victims for years. And, and I'm glad to welcome him in now, but I want someone for whom this is a real central issue. And there's no question in my mind that Secretary Clinton has been there from the very beginning. Congresswoman. From the very beginning. And people should look at that. Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty of Connecticut, thanks so much for being with us.